Good morning. Um, I, my name is Jordi Izzard, and I'm a SICE Alumni Relations Officer in Washington, D.C., and I'm here today with John Franklin, who graduated from SICE in 1967. And today's date is May 13th, 2013. And thanks so much for being with us, and we'll just have a little bit of a conversation. It makes it pretty old, eh? Uh, no, not at all. Um, so why don't we just start uh, with what originally brought you to SICE? Yeah. Um, I was in the Peace Corps in uh, Nepal in 1963 after graduating from college. And um, I went into the Peace Corps in order to uh, find a way to break up with my girlfriend, who I decided I didn't want to marry. Uh, but she did want to marry me, so it was very awkward, and her mother in particular was very, very disappointed that I chose to go overseas. So, as you can see, it was the height of um, public service and uh, self-sacrifice that drew me to the Peace Corps. Um, so I'm sitting out in uh, Nepal in the mountains below Mount Everest, having a great experience, I mean a magnificent experience and becoming quite fluent in the language, and all of a sudden the question, since I now no longer have a girlfriend, the question comes up, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And since I had become, over the course of a couple of years, extremely interested in the foreign aid program, I thought about that. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it would be a, a great career to be in the foreign assistance program of the kind that we worked with at AID uh, in Nepal. So. Um, I had, I thought I would go to graduate school, and of course the usual suspects turned up, Fletcher and Sice and so on. I had one problem, which is that I had taken one economics course in, in college and failed it. Actually, I dropped it because I was about to fail it. A clever uh, move. So I went and found, however I did this, I'm not sure, uh, found lots of economics textbooks, as in 10 or 15 and read every darn one of them, so that I was uh, not only prepared in economics, but I was, I would say, more than prepared. And applied to, to, to SICE, got in, and I, I really didn't know much about SICE, except that I had a, a classmate from college who had gone there right out of college and had a great experience that I, that I knew about. And I, I thought the fact that it had advanced in its title was a very catchy uh, marketing uh, advantage, and I was qu actually I was quite impressed that someone would do that, have the brass to put advanced in the title of a school. Uh, so that was that's why I went. That's great. And when you um, were at SICE in like the years 1965 to 67, tell us a little bit about your memories of being there. Um, okay, I'll work backwards because at the end of my two years at SICE, on schedule, um, as planned, I uh, got an offer from AID to go to Afghanistan. So I was relieved of all the anxiety of what to do with my life, which had, I mean, it had been a hard decision, and I was really relieved that this had happened. Approximately a week after I got the offer, I met this woman who I then mar wanted, who decided I wanted to marry. And uh, that was about 42 years ago. But it was clear before even I got her name straight that she was not likely to spend even a moment in Afghanistan. So I had my first career crisis. I offer in hand, fell in love, no go. So I, I went back to uh, AID and I said, I got a big problem. And they gave me a job in Washington. So that, that's the end of the story. I'll go back to, um, to uh, being there. Uh, I remember people such as Alan Platt and Jim Carries and Bonnie Wilson and Greg Smith, all of whom became very close friends. Um, I remember some great professors. I remember in particular uh, Professor Frank who I know everyone remembers because he was a great teacher and he was he had such a such a bearing about him. 
I remember, um, I don't remember the fellow, I think he was an adjunct professor who taught a course in Asia and wrote on the top of a paper that I had written, you should publish this. And I remember thinking, what is publish? I, I mean, I had no idea what this, I had no idea of the significance of this comment. I mean, it's really ignorant. So, long story short, I didn't publish it, but I should, probably should have. And it was about, it was about a very um, obscure uh, episode between the Chinese and the Nepalese in the, on the border of up in Tibet, where the Chinese army was causing the Tibetan, ethnic Tibetans, even then, a lot of trouble. That was just kind of a highlight. Uh, the language was a bear, and I'll never forget... What language? French. Uh -huh. I'll never forget uh, going in for my orals. This was a great moment. I mean, in my whole life, it was a great moment. And the guy says, uh, Monsieur Franklin, expliquez la différence entre les balances de paiement. You know, he wants me to describe the balance of payments between France and the United States. And I'm sitting there going, I'm talking French to him, and I'm going to talk about the balance of payments. And I pulled it off. I remember going like this a lot, you know, when I couldn't think of the word. Desperately. Or that was really a great moment. I remember uh, we had, so I remember the academics, but I also remember a lot of fun. Um, undergirding all of this for me was the question, what are you going to do with your life professionally? It haunted me because I, while I thought I knew, I didn't know quite how it was going to work out. And of course, as it turned out, I had reason to worry because I ran into a woman that wasn't going with me. Uh, so, you know, uh, but I remember a lot of fun. Jim Carrey was one complete character in our class, a wonderful guy. Uh, we lived, I lived in a great townhouse over on R Street, 17th and R. Had, I had roommates, I can't tell some of the stories. Uh, there's some very, there's one story that's so funny that it makes me almost double over thinking about it, but I can't tell it to you, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so, let's see, I think, uh, any, uh, any, any coaching questions in the middle, what, what have I left out? I don't know, were, were there any sort of historic events going on at the time you remember? Um, let's see, we're talking uh, 1965, Vietnam was, uh, mm -hmm. had not gotten to its worst, but um, it was bad, and we started having, uh, we started receiving, those of us who lived here, uh, a lot of protesters coming through. And of course it got, in 1968 when Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy both died, it became very uh, pronounced. But in the mid-60s it, uh, it was building. It was mm -hmm. real social discontent. And it was kind of new to us. You know, we we're kind of Eisenhower kids raised in a complete um, sanitized, most of us raised in very sanitized suburban settings. Mm -hmm. So this idea of protest was very foreign to me. Um, Francis Wilcox was a dean. He had an assistant who's still in town named, her name used to be Sally Hand, and she married a guy who became a general in the army. And I had a big crush on her, and I, I still see her at our country club. And I still have a bit of a crush on her. She's very cute. And she kind of ran the school, I think. You know, she was the practical one. And uh, I have to tell you one story. You're going to think I'm a bad person when you finish this. But we, I had, uh, between, between years, um, I went to Hawaii, where I was recruited to teach uh, Peace Corps volunteers who were about to leave for Nepal how to, I forget what we were teaching them, but it was something about Nepal, obviously. So I get a job, a paying job, to go to Hawaii to teach. So I'm thinking, this is really it. To make the whole story perfect, I fell in love with yet another woman. This is before I fell in love with my wife. And so it was really a, an amazing experience. This, this summer was like something out of a book.
you know. So I, of course, invited her to come back at Christmas time, and I went out to Dulles Airport where at that in those years there was no security. So I walked right to the gate. It was, she was arriving for some reason at one o'clock in the afternoon, uh, in the morning. I mean, she gets off the plane. She comes down the, you know, the chute. I take one look at her and I realize it's over. I've lost any feeling for her. And that was a nightmare. I had to fake it for about like four days before I figured out how to disentangle myself. I mean, really awful. So that, that, was, that was another highlight, a low light. Uh, let's see what else. You think of any others? I'm trying to think if, yeah. if there's a. Was there, in, in terms of like sort of the, your, your career when you graduated from SICE, was there any lead up? Um, I mean, you kind of described a little bit of, of what happened uh, with Afghanistan. Yeah. But, and then being in Washington. Tell us a little bit about, like, once you graduated from SICE. Yeah. What, what your career started out as and how yeah. it evolved. Well, when, when I decided not to go to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and to pursue this uh, lady, I got a job on the India de in the India desk at AID in Washington. And that struck me at the time as a very good compromise. What I didn't realize was that working in Washington is quite different from working in the field. And uh, let's put it politely and say that I learned about myself that I am a terrible bureaucrat. I'm a very uh, impatient, restless kind of person and it was it was a nightmare. I was lucky I didn't have a fatal stroke or kill someone or I mean, it, was, it was really a mis, mismatch. Fortunately, uh, I realized quite soon that I, I was completely fish out of water. Um, shortly thereafter, maybe a year and a half into it, we're all a whole bunch of us from SICE and the Peace Corps, and a whole bunch of us knew each other. We're all there kind of for, for the same reason because we had learned and gotten excited about foreign assistance. And one day, um, it was the first job in life, as, as you know. As you, but guy comes down the hall with a with a uh, what looked like a huge A and P shopping cart filled with thick uh, files. Franklin, and he hands them out to all of my friends on the floor, who all of whom had one and a half years experience because we all come back at the same time, and we're all let go by Lyndon Johnson. Uh, we're all out of work. I'm getting married in a week, and uh, so I'm getting married. Uh, I have no job, and uh, <laughs> and I'm so frustrated professionally I can barely stand myself. So it was a, it was a sort of tax. I called my. Fiance. I hope the honeymoon was fun. Well, actually, you know, it's a great question because, and I would have forgotten to mention this. I was planning to take the same woman that I described earlier, lady, I should say, to. India, which probably would have snuffed out our marriage in about 48 hours. I mean, she's as, she'd be as happy in India as I would be, uh, you know, underwater for 12 days. I mean, it just, it was a terrible idea. So we didn't go. We went to Florida, and we had a wonderful uh, honeymoon. Uh, we're still married, and uh, that, was, that was a real, so I called her up, and I said, I just got fired from my job. Do you still want to get married? And it was a long pause. I mean, a scary long pause. And she said, yeah, let's go ahead with it. I don't have any options. <laughs> uh, so uh, then the career started to, I, I conducted, this is true, I conducted a job search for one day. The following day I had a job offer, which I accepted, with a contractor for AID, a guy I'd known through another connection. And that turned out to be just a, that, that was the beginning of my good luck, I think you'd say professionally. So did you get married with a job then? Uh, yes, yeah. that's right. So you yes. did actually. And my father-in-law was very happy about that. Yes. I remember. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so then I, so I went to this, what was then called a, it was a American Technical Assistance Corporation. We did feasibility studies for AID, we did, I worked a lot on domestic stuff 
for the poverty program, the war on poverty. We used to go to counties in all over the southeast and help them set up um, uh, organizations which would receive the grants from the government to fund anti-poverty efforts in that county. So I found myself talking in, in church groups you know, in front of 300 people and writing strategic plans to fight poverty, but nevertheless strategic plans. It's quite interesting. And um, so I did that for about six years. We sold the business and I worked for the parent company and got into a tangle with a five-star general. Uh, it, was a, it was a defense contractor and we were kind of there they're peace guys, and we were there, good guys. And I remember taking on this, the chairman was a five-star general, and I remember saying to him, uh, do I have this right? I, I mean, I, I was obviously more sophisticated than this, but basically I said, am I right in thinking that this company does better in time of war than peace, and that therefore peace is not in the interest of this company? Because something had been published that basically said that, and he got, you know, he got sideways. But that turned out to be a great chapter in my career. I spent, I don't know, about 10 years there. Uh -huh. And then I was getting very frustrated. And a guy, another completely fortuitous thing happened. I was in a cab going to the airport. And in those days, they, we shared cabs. And we lived in Georgetown. We stopped, and a guy had met at a cocktail party, a dinner party, a few weeks before was in the cab. And before we got to the airport, he said to me, I'd like you to consider joining my business. Uh, I'm in the headhunting business. And in those years, long story short, in those years, headhunting to me was sort of the bottom of the barrel. I mean, sort of the low end of the low end. And it wasn't a profession, and it wasn't. And so I talked to him for months, and my wife was actually very helpful in this. She said, you know, I can understand why you're not, it doesn't, feel quite right because it's not going to look, you don't think it's cosmetically right, but everything you've said about it sounds like you. People, studying people and understanding people, and leadership and da 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 da. So uh, long story short, I went with a little consult, uh, headhunting firm for about, I don't know, six years and then we closed that down because the guy had some kind of a midlife thing and uh, I ended up at Russell Reynolds Associates where I spent most of my career. Uh -huh. And it turned out to be, while it had nothing to do with international affairs at all, it, um, it was a great career for me. Uh -huh. Did international ever come up in terms of posting people? Do you post people yeah. internationally? Yeah. yeah. And I was sent out to Hong Kong to fix a big problem we had out there and ended up in China. We had a, we had a dishonest partner and I had to kind of track that down. So it was, it was not unhelpful. It just wasn't a classic size career at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of this. Have you? Yes. In fact, we met with a psychiatrist in Philadelphia the other day. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in. She felt it was instrumental in her career, just having the cultural background. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's um. Well, that takes us to something that I have had quite a bit of experience with. Was is the size students who I've, I've probably seen. Uh, 30 of them over the years coming out and Ron Lambert has used me as yeah. a kind of screen and almost all of them, and this is really an important point, almost all of them have a really difficult time presenting themselves in any way that I'm accustomed to seeing in the, in the market that I came, you know, the, the professional market. They don't know what they want. They if they do, they all say the same thing. I want to be an investment banker or management consultant. There's no, um, they really need coaching on how to do an elevator speech for two minutes and present themselves as unique. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to have anything to do with, as we've all agreed, it doesn't have to have anything to do with international affairs. It's got to have something to do with them, who they are at that time in their life. And they have been, I'd have to say as a group of people, they've been really under-equipped when they've come over here to present themselves professionally. And it worries me a great deal about how they present when they're out in the mm -hmm. market. Now I know it's not all of them, probably the ones who get sent over here are the ones who need remedial help. But it's been really striking. 
They're all competent, and they're all smart, and they're all energetic. They all have a lot to offer, uh, but they don't present well and introduce themselves well. Mm -hmm. So in terms of advice you might have for current students today, how would you, what would you offer them? Well, I think back on the chapter that I just described to you in my own life mm -hmm. where I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I mean, no idea. And um, so it's a very good question. I mean, had I been sitting in the chair of the people I was interviewing, it would have been probably worse. So I guess you have to you have to work with what you got. And I knew I was interested in foreign assistance. And I knew something about foreign assistance. I could put together a two-minute pitch on that and why I might be interested in that. And even though it didn't work out that way, um, it would have been a topic on which a conversation could have gotten started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and your great career and for all you do to help people in the world. It's my and, pleasure. Yeah, and have a, a wonderful oh, let day. Me, yeah. Can I make yeah, one? Yeah, sure, of, absolutely. One thing that's been sort of a highlight for me has been being part of the professional development committee that Ron Lambert put together. And mm -hmm. it, it's um, Gordon Bodner is the chairman and uh, several faculty members and staff. And it's been really a good way to stay in touch with the school because it gets to exactly to the question mm -hmm. that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Connecting with How the How do you get these students. kids ready yeah. for the job market? Yeah, and they're so appreciative. And yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks for coming.